Hi, my name is Yannick Tondelanger. Welcome to Between the Bars, the podcast where life and music mingle in conversations with the people who shape and who are the Mahler Chamber Orchestra. The violinist Kirsty Hilton and the trombonist Mark Hampson both had no idea when they left their native countries in the 1990s that they would eventually help to shape and define one of the world's finest orchestras. Their musical emigration in their tender 20s took them from carefree teenagehood in sunny Sydney to poverty student life in London, big career breaks in Germany to work in Spain and China, and finally into what became the musical social family that is the Mahler Chamber Orchestra. Kirsty, while living in Germany, became so homesick for her native Australia that one cold Bavarian winter, this is what she did. Once I remember I putting sun cream on inside the house just to have the smell of summer. And Mark, while describing the air in Shouju, China, gave me a rundown of what an AQI index is and why he had to check it every single day. Yeah, well, it's amazing because I didn't even know what an AQI, you know, was. Suddenly it becomes a thing you look at every single morning, before the weather, before anything. I joined them both in Adelaide, Australia, where we were performing at the Adelaide Festival. We enjoyed some local red wine with our chat. I could recommend you also do the same while you're listening. And if you stay right to the end, you'll find out something quite remarkable that connects Australia and three particular pieces written by the composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. All right, I want to say welcome to um, MCO's very first podcast today. I've got two MCO musician members, uh, Mark Hampson, trombone, um, Kirsty Hilton, violin. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for joining us um, in Adelaide. Uh, Adelaide, Australia. We're playing at the Adelaide Festival here, rehearsing as well. So we're here for around four or five days, I think, or six days. Even. Yeah, almost um, a, a week, week, I think. Yeah. Or yeah, almost a week. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's like uh, is it four days of rehearsal? Yeah, three concerts. Three concerts. It's quite intense. Yeah, very intense. And then we fly, I don't know, a few thousand kilometers up to uh, to Japan, yeah. and then yeah. we finish in Shanghai. There's a small theme going here for this podcast: musical emigration. Very, um, very special for you two because you spent many years outside of your home countries. Um, so I want to start with you, Kirsty. You are from Australia, from Sydney. Yes, from Sydney. First of all, what's it like playing here in, in your home country anyway? It's great. I mean, this is the first time I'm the only one without jet lag <laughs> arriving at the beginning of a tour. Everyone knows how I normally feel. Um, um. And, yeah, so we have been to Australia once before with MCO to Sydney and Melbourne. But, um, yeah, just to be in Australia. This is probably the most prestigious festival in Australia, I right, think, yeah, Adelaide I Festival. It's actually called the Festival State, South Australia is. Right. Um, so they're very proud of this festival and, um, yeah, it's probably one of the oldest festivals. I don't know that exactly, but it's definitely the most famous one and people travel from all over Australia to yeah. come to it. I didn't so, realise how huge it was. It it's, is very big. I mean, walking around, and when you look at the, read the program, mm. it's massive. So, yeah, it's great to be part of that. I actually haven't ever played in the festival before, so that's exciting. Of course, um, you're from Australia, but you have spent many years in another country. Exactly. And that's what I want to get, get on to. Let's talk a bit about uh, your history. You obviously grew up in Australia, in Sydney. In Sydney, yeah. But at some point... You uh, and you studied music, but at some point you disappeared off to Europe. Exactly. Why did? How did that come about? What was? Well, about? most Australians go and study abroad at one point. Just we feel very isolated here because the music world is just very small. Yes. It's it's a very high level in Australia, but yeah, you do just feel very far away, and there's so few orchestras for a career as well. I mean, there's only yeah. six orchestras in Australia, or something like that, mm. seven maybe. I actually went straight into Australian Chamber Orchestra from school and just thought, because I was so young then, 18, mm. that I needed to mm. do something else. So, yeah, in 98 I went to London first for a year 
to study. Right. So were, were you a Guildhall? Or? I was a Guildhall, oh, yeah, right, okay. doing the advanced solo studies, which was great, but I actually didn't have any money to stay longer than a year. I had no working yeah. visa there. I couldn't do any work as a musician, so I was doing babysitting and things, but my scholarship money was just going down quickly in London. So basically I needed, I wanted to go to Germany after that because I knew it was free to study. Yeah, and that's that's a big point, isn't it? That mm-hmm. I mean, basically the course costs hardly anything. Yeah. And if, for example, if you're in a city like Berlin, it's you know much cheaper to live exactly. in London. Exactly, yeah. Especially back then. Yeah, I mean, the difference Especially. was really marked. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I auditioned for Carry On Academy, which I knew about from from being in Australia, actually, through the youth orchestra. We'd had several chamber music courses with members of the Berlin yeah. Phil. And the Carry On Academy, that's the official orchestra academy of the Berlin Phil. Exactly, the yeah. training academy. And I'd visited Berlin a few times and loved it. And then I was lucky enough to, to get into Carry On Academy and then... That's when I ended up staying in Germany for 10 years. We're going to get on to your, um, how should I say, professional years in Germany. Mm -hmm. Um, But first I want to ask, Mark, your journey to Germany. Now, Kirsty, you said how you made your way via England um, to Germany. How did you, what was the catalyst for you? Because you're English, I should say. Yeah. Born bred. (laughs) Born and bred, absolutely. (laughs) And, of course, you did uh, a large part of your studies in England, London. Yeah, I did my undergraduate at the Guildhall. You so I was there for Guildhall. four years. Do you know what you realise? That yeah. means all three of us were at Guildhall. Well, really? Yeah, we were yeah. there, I think, at the same time. Were we there at even. the same time? Yeah. But uh, you don't remember. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we are talking <laughs> mid, no, we are talking early, early 90s. 90s. <laughs> 91 to 95, I was then. I was the, 98. The, yeah, yeah. You were a little, yeah, a little later. But, you know, I, I, I did my postgraduate in Mannheim. But um, it was something I, it was kind of the opposite thing. It, I encountered quite a lot of resistance um, in London to studying elsewhere. Well, why did you, what, what, why did you decide to, because it is a different school, especially for brass players. Why did you decide to go flavor the German <laughs> brass school? I can say that it's because of, um, that I really wanted to broaden myself and all these, you know, great reasons. But actually it was money. Mm-hmm. Again, it was just that. Cheaper to study. Much cheaper. And I had a DIAD scholarship this um, sort of exchange service. It comes from the German government, but for foreign students. German government paid you. Yeah, to and, and it was an there. amazing scholarship. I mean, they cover yeah. travel, living costs, obviously fees. Right. So this was something that I just couldn't get in London. And then uh, as Kirsty says, you know, I mean, in London, for any student is a, is a challenge, you know, from the point of view of living there and costs. So for me, it was, a, it was kind of a no-brainer, really. Right. But I encountered a lot of resistance, yeah, from, from my old professors. and In what way? In, in sort of why do it? What's the point? Where the centre of the universe? Or... Yeah. <laughs> I think, <laughs> and I think it's a bit of a British phenomena, you know, that, um, particularly London-centric, you know, that, that, that that's the place to be. And there are wonderful things going on there, of course. Okay, so we're, you both moved on to Germany. Kirsty, if I'm thinking of the situation you, you were able to have, you, you joined the Carry On Academy, the, the Academy of the Berlin Philharmonic. From what I understand, you're almost playing in that ensemble every week. Yeah. Near enough. I think I did play every week through pretty much. <laughs> For in like my two years. Yeah. Amazing concerts, amazing repertoire. It's, um, I mean, it's a, a scarily impressive um, experience. Yeah. I was very lucky. It was amazing. Before I went there, I'd never played a Mahler symphony or a Bruckner symphony. Right. And then I did them all for the first time with Claudio or Bruckner with Gunter Wandt. I remember the first time, one of my first weeks, we did Beethoven triple with Barenboim, Perlman and Yogo Ma. <laughs> and that was for me just like, I couldn't believe that these three people were on stage at the same time. Um, Weren't you terrified? I mean... I don't know. I mean, I was still, I was only 20 actually, so... I think I was still a bit naive and, you know, you don't, things get harder later. <laughs> so I didn't think yeah. about it as much as That's I would good. overanalyze things now. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I just enjoyed it. I guess it's also the first time you come into contact with that that kind of charisma, you know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know, when you see, because of course you can see someone on a video or hear them on a recording, but then when you're on stage and you experience them, these guys do have amazing charisma, yeah. don't they? And exactly. You, you, it's something you... 
It's really yeah, tangible. Realized, I think what I realised is was the importance of a conductor as well. Mm. <laughs> you know, before that, it's just not just running. keeping time. Yeah, but it's the real questions that yeah. people often ask. Like, what? Do they, and yeah, that's when exactly. you feel actually what it is. Yeah. yeah, and just that difference in the concert of the inspiration that comes that makes the difference from yeah. what you've rehearsed. You know, that's such a powerful word, charisma, isn't it? And yeah, all, it's it's uh, something that you can't quantify. No, and you sort of. If you if you happen to join a more regular orchestra and your life becomes more routine, and then one day someone special comes along again, and you realise, ah, oh, yeah, that's what it was about. Exactly, yeah. it was that word charisma, and that person with charisma doesn't even need to say, you know, three sentences. No, and you're doing it. You're there. Yeah, they can they can even be uh, technically not the greatest conductor. No. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. You no. know, in that situation. Yeah, it's amazing. So you've done you've done the Carrion Academy, as if that wasn't enough. You then suddenly got you have to correct me if I'm wrong. You got yeah. no less than two jobs, in two <laughs> two of the best orchestras in the world in two days. In, in two days. <laughs> well, yeah, in Munich. So I in in the was it Munich, Bayer? Munich Philharmonic one day yes. and then Bayer the next day. Explain for those who are not uh, for those who don't know what Bayer oh, is. Oh, Bayer Schulenfunk. Bayer, so the Symphony radio orchestra, orchestra. The radio orchestra right. of Bayer. And these are not. Any two orchestras? No, they're, they're good <laughs> orchestras. I mean, I guess that was one thing from Carrion Academy. Um, they re- there was quite a lot of pressure that you get a good job out of it, you know, even what you applied for. So I'd done one in Munich, Phil, actually, before that that I didn't get. Yeah. That was my first audition. And then, yeah, and then I did that and I got that. And then I, Bayerische Wundfunk was, I don't know, I wanted to go there. So I still did the audition the next day. And, and ended up worked. getting that. Yeah, I don't know wow. if they they knew I'd just got the job in Munich film. Maybe that's why they wanted me. And also, I mean, that's doing an audition. It's not. <laughs> it's easier said than done. I mean, just in a couple of sentences, what is it? Tips from the top. What is the key if you're going to nail that? Well, I think the main thing I learned. I remember Guy Brownstein telling me, the person who win the job is not necessarily who plays the best on the day it's who gives the most on the day and in an audition I find it easier than a concert in a way because you know it's a short amount of time actually so less time you have to concentrate Um, but you have to in that short space of time really show something special so when I was practicing Mozart concerto or something that in the first few lines you're showing something different from everybody else different musically musically yeah. Technique is taken well, for granted, to, yeah. but you have to show your personality, your own charisma. Yeah, and I'd spent hours and hours like on the opening two lines of the Mozart concerto mm-hmm. <laughs> and just that it was 150% secure. Right. And, yeah, so I just sort of had a way of practising that I... But you mean so that it was 100% technically secure so that you could express yourself over Myself the top of and exaggerating everything in it, exactly. Right. So every guy also had me always playing, he said, do it till you feel it's ridiculous, you know, because it doesn't come across. Mm. Sp- you know, often Berlin Phil don't have a screen, but a lot of orchestras do. And all of that, those little details don't come through, actually, unless you really exaggerate. So, yeah, I guess it was playing in a different way from how I'd perform it in a concert. Mark, can I ask you, um, was your first job in Germany? Did you continue in germany after your studies Did you no, come back to england no i uh, i i didn't i had a sort of a, a two-year contract in a german opera house in mannheim yeah um but i didn't actually get the fixed job there so you can say like parallel to my studies i was working and doing a lot of opera and stuff like that but my first job that was actually my job was, was grand canary where I, where I still am can we <laughs> let's talk about that now because now now for those who are listening now You've been in Germany and now you've moved to Spain. Spain is where you're establishing your professional career. Mm -hmm. And as you said, as I think I read in your notes, the polar opposites of Europe. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, describe that culturally, musically, the food. Yeah, in in every way, every possible way. And and, I mean, the Canaries, it's a special place because it's, um, it's a kind of a midway between Europe and South America. So it's even between the Spanish see it as being quite Latino, you know, so okay. sort of towards Cuba and Venezuela. Latino in the way of, uh, I don't know, partying, staying up later, even later than in Spain. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know about that. But yeah, we certainly, um, I mean, there's big carnival culture there. And, and certainly the first sort of two years I was there, I, 
I didn't see many Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't play in many concerts on Sunday. Uh, no, never. I mean, for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, as a musician, um, difference as a musician. I mean, you you're saying hierarchically. What is it you said? As a as a musician in England, a more flat hierarchy. Yeah. The, Germany more hierarchical. China, which we'll get onto in a minute, because you also lived in China, extreme hierarchy, and then Spain, a mess. <laughs> I, I would, don't know if I should really put it like that. That's maybe that. <laughs> okay, you, you, we can strike that. Maybe in private. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it's basically, I think if you're used to the Germ, German sort of culture where things tend to be organized and in general work quite well, then when you when I moved somewhere like that, it took me about three years to slow down and just to accept that, for example, if you go and do some piece of paperwork in a government office, then you have to accept you will have to go there three or four times. Wow. Because you won't have, whatever you do, you won't have the right papers. You will, something will be missing yeah. or something will have changed. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's a, to, to, in order, you have to actually slow yourself down and, and relax into things there yeah. if you're going to enjoy you know, your time there. Was there something you felt in Spain that that you couldn't have in Germany, or you know, oh, yeah. a way that you could experience your music, even if it's just a way? Oh, I can relax more, so I can, I find I'm freer to do different things yeah, with I mean, my that, music. That's the main point. I think Germany is an amazing country. I mean, of course, it's a great country to live and work as a musician. That's clear. But my experience was that when I was studying there and and playing in the you know on this contract, there's a very particular way of doing things, and that's the way to do it. Right. And and you there's not much flexibility, which is very good for studying because you learn a concept and you learn a way of doing things. Yeah. But then when I moved across to Spain, suddenly I found myself in a place where there isn't really an accepted way of doing things and you're quite free to develop the way you play how you want. Did you, know? you ever have the impression maybe conductors who came there enjoyed that aspect or they felt, oh, I can, I don't know, mould the interpretation more? Or? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think it's, an, it's an orchestra that's quite open-minded and, and, and fairly sort of blank canvas, you know. And tell us again which orchestra exactly. It's in the Canaries, it's the... Grand Canary Philharmonic. Grand Canary Philharmonic, yeah. right. Yeah. I feel that in Australia a bit too, I have to say. I can imagine it's a similar yeah. thing. And yeah, we have yeah. people, I remember Nigel Kennedy saying to us um, that he liked coming when there's not you know, because we don't have a huge tradition because we're so young, the, yes. you know, the orchestra, that yeah. he can then exactly. be not set in our ways and this is the way yeah. we do it and you can actually do more sometimes. It's amazing. Yeah. I often feel that with MCO thing. as well. Yeah, it, exactly. Being a young ensemble, yeah. travel such a lot, you, um, so many influences. Yeah. I mean, you have your traditions, but they always have to be flexible, intelligent traditions. Yeah. Um, Kirsty, but you didn't stay in Germany. I mean, I hang on, you've been to <laughs> maybe the best orchestral academy in the world you joined two of the best org i mean yeah you're by all Played accounts in. an extra i remember when when you first started playing in mco around 2000 very yeah. near the beginning yeah and i distinctly remember when i first met you i think it was at festival Aix en provence was one of the first times yeah. we worked together we had to do some chamber music together you didn't yeah. have to. I mean, yeah. it was great. We did, we did, I uh, was in Mozart Horn Quintet. Horn Quintet. You Quintet. probably don't remember yeah, it. I do remember. I was terrified. You terrified. What? I was, no, really. <laughs> <laughs> All I, I knew was that, that this, this <laughs> girl had come from Karen Academy, you know, and I think, I don't even know whether you'd got your jobs yet in Munich. No, I don't. I think I was still in Berlin at that time, yeah. Intimidating person you are. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was very good for me. <laughs> but yeah. then, uh, years later, Okay, what happens then? You leave Germany. Yeah, I mean, I had a great time in Germany, so it's not that I hated my time there or anything, not at all. I was happy in Munich, loved the orchestra, loved the job. Um, but I knew I didn't want to stay there forever. I didn't want to end up retiring in Bavaria. For me, the mentality <laughs> you didn't is want just, to retire. I the didn't. Beer? No, the I think it's just it's such a different it's a beautiful mentality. City. It is a beautiful city. But when you're not from there, I mean, one of the main things for me is the weather. I'm really fixated on weather. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they have amazing uh, summers and amazing winters in the world. Well, I mean, you've got the snow. Yeah, I mean, I don't ski or anything, so something like that yeah. I don't really appreciate. Um, and the summers, it's beautiful, but it's such a short time. You know, if it was six months, it would right. be okay, but it's not. It's three maybe that's decent. And I would get actually quite depressed in the winter. I mean, not depressed, but I'd 
you know, I <laughs> once I remember I putting sun cream on inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> just to have the smell of summer oh, to remember. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember everyone said, okay, so it's time to go home, Kirsten. That's a little bit sad, but anyway, yeah, I understand the yeah, point. So. I'm curious but just to ask you something because, I mean, I guess you've been back here for quite a while now, but what I've found, I mean, I've been away now for 24 years from, from England, yeah. um, but I look back at England with sort of nostalgia and great affection. Yeah. But when I get back there, I realise that I'm actually not that English anymore. Right. And it's quite challenging then to be there you know, I don't. Yeah. I guess you've been back here for a while I've now. Been, but yeah. Was it like that at the beginning? Or um, I mean, I always felt very at home in Australia immediately. Yeah. But yeah, there's certain things I remember when I first moved back, just trying to get an apartment and things, and I didn't have a utilities bill or anything to show. You know, I was like a complete alien then. Yeah. You know, then feel like a foreigner. And I had been ten years in Germany, which is a long time. And also the years yeah. between twenty and thirty. You know, you change a lot in that time. So, um. But I always felt Australian, I think. So you went back to live in uh, the awful ci- city of Sydney. Exactly. <laughs> with exactly. that terrible nature and view. And- it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's pretty amazing, Sydney. I just love it. And, yeah, I lived right on the water oh, God. for about nearly 10 years. But um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I mean, the dilemma wasn't over. No, and it took me a long time actually to feel – settled in the job and just had I made a big mistake because, I mean, by Schoenfunk is one of the top orchestras in the world and, um, yeah, I especially loved working with Maris Janssens, who's still chief there. I, I love him. Right. Um, you have to get him to come to Sydney Symphony. Yeah, I know. I've tried. He's, you know, he's getting old and the, that's the problem in Australia. We're just so far away. It's hard yeah. to get people. Um, and also they nearly need to have two weeks free because coming – with the arrival, just the time it takes to get there and back, you know, it doesn't, you can't even have just one week no. free to oh fit it God. in. So the big people who are busy, it's very, very difficult. Should we start talking about jet lag? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how are your jet lags, by the way? Well, I don't have it. Are you the <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You don't have Good it. Good question. Yeah. yeah. This is the one occasion where you don't have it I on know. an MCO tour. I know, it's amazing. And you're back in Europe how often each year? About four or five times right. a year. I try to do the longer projects with MCO. For Marla Chamber Orchestra, of yeah. course. Yeah, for Marla Chamber Orchestra. And you found a balance, you think? I think so. Um, I mean, yeah, it's I sort of like the flying less and less as I get older, I have to admit. Yeah, but then you think, doesn't... look, it's just a day of your life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then once I'm there, I love it, you know? Yeah. Sometimes when I am in Sydney, I think, oh, you know, to have to get on the flight again and things. And then I'm there and I'm planning in when the next trip is. And I don't think that's necessarily even the long haul flying. I mean, I feel that just no. when I have to leave home and go. Exactly. You know, just... 50 minute flight into yeah, Europe or something. Yeah. So for me, it is perfect. Yeah. So for a long time, I wondered if I'd done the right thing and. I did go back and do a six month contract in Munich. And oh right, so you really, tr- you really yeah, thought about did, stepping back into the German about work it. scene? Yeah, not that I was unhappy in Sydney, I, I was, but just yeah, torn. I guess. Yeah. I read a book I remember called Leaving Paradise <laughs> by <laughs> an Australian author who she wasn't a musician, but just had lived in Amsterdam for a long time, and right. then moving back, and just the whole thing that after a certain amount of time, you are always torn between the because it is still home uh-huh. there's something you know because t- your 10 years is a long time especially the well, i mean those yes. years where you you know become an adult and everything and um so did you did you feel you really had a foot in two different cultures i did in the beginning yeah and always will or i think i always will like while will you i'm ever still give going one up? Um, or, or is it that stage in your life? For me, it's a stage where I, I couldn't possibly imagine giving, giving up Marla yeah. Chamber And I know, like we all do, all the negatives. Yeah. But it'll probably be there for the rest of my yeah, career Yeah, exactly. Now. I mean, I don't want to give it up. The only reason I would give it up is just if I had to, you know, and if, yeah. I mean, Sydney is my full-time job. and mm. if, But they're very good with me, with letting me do things good. at so the moment. Should be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all working out. But no, I would I wouldn't want to, but given up right but yeah let's see see how it goes happens. yeah listen we're going to take a little break now um the podcast will continue with other tasty things and we're going to come back in a second Ah, 
truly iconic opening of Mozart's 40th Symphony, a sound sketch that has become part of the fabric of human history, and on this recording, one of MCO's own performances with conductor Daniel Harding. While Kirsty and Mark top up their glasses with more Australian red and I go look up who wrote the book Leaving Paradise, take a listen to the first of, I hope, many Matty moments. Matthias Meyer, our talented stage manager, takes the microphone outdoors and, in his first encounter, chats to someone who is intimate with some completely different performers who've also flown across the globe to give pleasure to audiences here in Adelaide. Hey, I'm Matti, and I'm used to be tired. As the stage manager of the Mahler Chamber Orchestra, I'm the first to arrive at the concert hall and the last one who leaves. So being tired on tour is quite a normal thing for me. But this time, it was different. Imagine tour life. You finish a concert late at night and early next morning you are already sitting in a bumpy bus or a train or an airplane on the way to the next venue. You play another concert and the next morning the same again. And again. And again. For the next two weeks. And then there are tours where it's hard to even start fresh. I'm talking about these journeys that bring you far away from home where clocks tick different. Changing time zones usually brings a special guest on tour. Hello, jet lag. Jet lag is not a joke, especially when you have to follow a working schedule. So there we were in Adelaide, and this time jet lag hit us really hard. Going to South Australia basically meant going to the other side of the world. Adelaide is seven and a half hours ahead of my hometown in Europe. That's a lot. And even after four days, I was still running around like a sleepwalker. I decided to get some help. There must be a better way to deal with jet lag. And as I kept thinking, who's an expert on frequent flying? Who shares that crazy travel life with us? It came to me. Yes, birds. Being the prototype of a frequent flyer, I wanted to talk to them, or at least to someone who knows all about them. And that's how I met Kate. So you're a bird expert, is that right? Well, I'm a bird lover. I don't know if I'm an expert, I know quite a bit, but I wouldn't like the label expert. But I'm the Secretary of Birds SA and I love birds very much. Birds SA stands for Birds South Australia. It's the oldest ornithological society of the country, founded in Adelaide over 100 years ago. They have nearly a thousand members and besides conservation work and research, they organize monthly bird watching trips open for everyone. Kate was not always a passionate bird lover. She recalls a single moment back in 2003 that drew her into bird watching. I went to Broome up in Western Australia on holidays and I booked a tour with a bird person. And I booked that tour simply because I wanted to go camping in the Kimberley. And he had a telescope and put it up on a bird. It was a bird that lives along the shoreline and in water. It's called a pied stilt. And I just couldn't believe these long pink legs. In our conversation about birds, Kate drew a funny connection. Many Australian birds, they dress in black and white and many of them can sing. So they make beautiful music just like you. Hang on. Dressed in black and white and making beautiful sound? That reminds me of someone. And there are more similarities. Just like us, some birds travel really far. We all heard about migratory birds that spend the summer breeding in the north and then travel for the winter times to the warm south. But how far do they fly? Can they compete with our journey from Europe to Australia? You've travelled 16,000 kilometres. They travel further than you. They travel 20,000 kilometres in one season. And you do it in an aeroplane, sitting in a seat, they fly. 
20,000 kilometers. That's an impressive number. Time for my big question. I wanted to know from Kate, how do these birds handle the enormous effort of such a long journey? How do they cope with jet lag? First of all, they cope better than you in that they feed up. They increase their body weight between 50 and 70 percent. So looking at you, you need another 50 percent to cope better. Well, that's not really an option for us. Imagine the whole orchestra putting on another 50 percent of their body weight before going on tour. Super size me. We'd need at least two seats in the plane for each player, and we would maybe even be way too heavy to travel all together in one plane. But then Kate came up with something really stunning. They have discovered that these birds have a trait that no humans have. They can close one eye and shut off half their brain and sleep on one side of their body and fly with the other and then swap over. So when you've learnt that technique, you will cope with jet lag. Wow, that sounds like fiction, right? I mean, birds have there some super skills that I was not aware of. Let's have a look on another issue with traveling long distance. We as an orchestra are aware that flying has an impact on the environment. But what about birds? What's their carbon footprint? Very limited, because they eat what's in the mud, and what they deposit back in the mud is useful. They clean out their system every two minutes, so it's a very quick cycle. Um, but their carbon footprint is, is nothing, really. I mean, they're just very gentle on the environment. If you sum it up, birds are the smarter travelers. Facing climate change, the discussion about the environmental impact of traveling is coming more and more upfront, also in the classical music world. Up until now, I don't see an easy solution. On the one hand, orchestras on tour are depending on airplanes. On the other hand, we bring such a cultural benefit to the people. And so do the birds. The benefit is very similar as far as people go to what you, you do with your music. Because they bring beauty, they bring wonder, you know, they bring a whole new experience for people to see a, a small bird that weighs an ounce and to think that it's flown that distance to come down here to Adelaide and you could say to see me if you like. The same beauty is bought by you flying the same distance to come here for a few days to share your music and it draws people together across the world because uh, culturally we are quite different from Indonesia, Japan, uh, Korea, China, but these birds need some of the stopping off points there, just like you need a stop off point in your plane. So we need to make a connection with those people to show them the benefit of caring for their coastline, their environment. So these birds, if they want to stop off to feed, have got somewhere to stop off to feed. And I believe that link with our cultures is an understanding that's not gained in any other way. It connects the people together just like music does. Music speaks every language, so do birds. What a beautiful way of connecting birds and orchestras. And what a beautiful way of connecting people through nature and music. Talking to Kate has been a real pleasure. It seems her thoughts easily cross all borders. They fly and stop where they want. If you are in Adelaide and you want to go bird watching, check out Birds SA. Check out their website www.birdssa.asn.au. There you find all the information about field trips they do, where you can easily join. And what's for sure, the next time when I fly to Australia, before I hop on the plane, I will close one eye and tape it real strong. And then let's see how fresh I will touch ground in Adelaide. Okay, we're back. Mark, your 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 chapter's not finished. You went off to uh, you went off to China for a year. Yeah, it's like you didn't go yeah. home to England after Germany. You continued to a, oh, sorry, after Spain. After you continue Spain. you continue to another country. So you've done England, Germany, Spain, and now we're China. Tell us about China. China, yeah. I mean, it, it was a funny thing because it it was a sort of opportunity that came up rather suddenly, and. Um, And, uh, you know, it's just a, a startup, a new orchestra in Suzhou, which I'd never heard of and subsequently found out it's, I mean, it's a really amazing city. Right. It's certainly any Chinese people will tell you it's, a, it's one of the most beautiful cities in China, amazing old town and 
And and uh, yeah, I mean, I just got this opportunity and I suddenly thought, well, you know, why not? I mean, there's no reason I was uh, 45 at the time. I just thought it's yeah. a good time to go and get a, have a new adventure and yeah. see what it's like to live in another completely different culture. Completely different. Yeah. So, I mean, that was something really, that's very challenging. I, I, I think many people have asked me what it's like to live there. And I think it's a, it's a real country of extremes. You know, the, the, the good stuff is really amazing and totally exhilarating because many things are possible um, and totally different, kind of intoxicating in a way. But then the bad things are also <laughs> quite bad. You know, I mean, difficult, difficult to sort of live with. Are we allowed to talk about the bad things? Is I don't censored? know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the simple things, there's also, of course, there are the, there are the um, attitudes, you know, from... Um, you know, from the people and stuff like that. But also, I mean, the quite tangible things like the air quality. And which I remember someone telling me before I went there, you know, Suzhou's got quite an air quality problem and it's a factor. And of course you think, ah, whatever. You know? Yeah. And then you get there and you experience, you start to experience your first weeks uh, living in heavy pollution that we just don't, we just don't know about. So you, you're an expert on measuring pollution levels now with these meters? Or yeah, well, it's amazing because from never actually having thought, I didn't even know what an AQI, you know, an air quality index Tell us, was. Oh, an air quality index. Right? Yeah, and suddenly it becomes a thing you look at every single morning. Oh my God. You look at the forecast before, the weather before anything. Yeah, because really? it makes a difference to how you're going to feel. Every day you're thinking about it. Every day. And, no and were doubt. you sick from it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When it's bad, when it gets up to 250, 300, which is... It can be much worse, so that was typically what it could be around winter time. Right. Then it really, yeah, you basically feel like you've got a hangover the whole time. I mean, it's really, and, and you start, I started getting rashes. I started to, wow. you know, uh, have problems, obviously, obvious problems, breathe, you know, breathing and throat and stuff. So it's, it's a big thing. Yeah, yeah. Is it absolutely. something that, that, that you think you get used to, uh, like someone who's lived there all their life, they don't have this, these rashes think, or these reactions? In a way, it's the worrying thing is that when you, and I noticed this when I went away and came back, you know, as I said, I was traveling yeah. backwards and forwards, that when you first come back, your body reacts quite strongly and then it kind of gives up and, you know, and you stop getting these reactions after a while. So you can say you get used to it, but I don't think it's necessarily a good thing, you know. No. So. And artistically, musically, I mean, you were playing in an orchestra, but you were probably tutoring as well, teaching maybe or... Yeah, I mean, I had this Advising? Sort of, yeah, I had this kind of three-way, this three sort of triple role where I was playing in the orchestra, uh, te you know, teaching in theory and... Uh, and sort of consulting to the orchestra because they, they, it was a startup. And although they're very able and, and super ambitious, um, there are many sort of, they have some gaps in their knowledge when it comes to cultural management. Yeah. There must have been differences between them and Germany. Germany having such a history, or as we were saying, talking earlier, already with so many traditions that are great, but also can be stifling. Did you feel also that there was an openness there that they could maybe learn faster or they were not constrained well, with think, a tradition yeah I, well yes i suppose so i mean the the you know there's a there's a tremendous ability in in certain particularly in certain instruments there you know uh -huh. um when the string school is um they're very able and technically you know everybody has to learn the piano well, a cello or a absolutely violin. right i remember one day i was i went to Chengdu to actually to go and see the the pandas i was really ah. sort of happy to go and see see the pandas um but uh when i when i went to chengdu i got invited to go to meet the trombone professor at the conservatory and this is a conservatory which has thirty thousand students you know the, the, so the sichuan thirty thousand thirty thousand and then you That's amazing. It, it's, <laughs> it's like a whole different level and this place is enormous so ob obviously if, if you're teaching there how many students do you teach i mean i think trombones is like normal because almost no one wants to play the trombone oh, in right. china so how do they do an orchestra but, but i mean that the well the funny thing was that they have this huge long road that leads out of the conservatory which is just full of i mean literally hundreds of shops piano shops basically and i happened to be there on the day when they were doing the entrance exams and there were thousands of people practicing oh my so it was God. just my my memory of that day was walking down to get lunch with the, the professor bought me lunch and it was an amazing meal but um walking down just hearing this cacophony of uh of so how many practice rooms and things do they have there I, Thousands. I think actually not that many. I think they somehow... They're all they, practicing they, in the piano shops. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Precisely. They just go down the shop and try, try another piano, you know. Gosh. 
gosh. And that, that was a really bizarre and something that really stuck in my mind, you know. Mark, Kirsty, I want to talk about Marla Chamber Orchestra now and its place in your lives. Why do you not let go of it? Why, why, why do you think it will always be there? Why can't you? not let go of it um well we all have such close friends here now as well we've all known each other for so long right (laughs) that's part of it you know um and then yeah just the energy in the concerts of the orchestra Mm. is something very special it's addictive it is yeah it's a kind of performing that is addictive i remember actually one person that i was doing another one of the like q a sessions that we did yesterday and someone asked me i think it was in our academy project Mm. and i actually said to them yeah it's like a drug yeah, I mean, when you, exactly, when you perform exactly in this like orchestra, um, yeah. it, I mean, better, yeah. much better than a drug. Yeah. We'll say that now. <laughs> no, and you really feel it when you don't when you don't perform for a while, you know, and yeah. uh, even in great orchestras, which are wonderful. And, yeah. Yes. But there's something very special. And, and even also, in the rehearsals. Absolutely. And this whole yeah. thing of fact, because it's very easy. And I'm sure sometimes you look at like the material that we put out there mm. and it's family, you know, mm. it's mentioned often. I think this family idea and it can sound a little bit maybe cheesy, but cheesy, it's not, but it's, it's the really real true. deal. Mm. Yeah. It's really true. And it's funny because we all play in other orchestras, which is another aspect that um, probably unfortunately won't have time to cover in this podcast. But anyway, we all play in other orchestras um, in countries like a German orchestra or a Spanish orchestra that also have musicians from all over the world in them as well because the uh, music, classical orchestral music community is very international. Mm. But it's still anyway not the same as playing in Mahler Chamber Orchestra no. that also has musicians really from the entire globe. Exactly. Why I is guess, it so different? I guess it's the thing you were saying before, the nomadic yeah. sense of the orchestra. So it's... It's yeah, just something very special. Yeah, when you're, I mean, when you're on a project, and this has been said before, but it's really true. When you're on a project, that it's so intense because you're not at home thinking exactly. about your bills or thinking about <laughs> you're not going your to a dentist fa- appointment. I mean, yeah, you know. I mean, I notice even with my Sydney Symphony yeah. with my orchestra on tour, it's a totally different feel as yeah. well. You know, yeah. but we get to have that the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it is much more intense. Yeah. Everything is much more intense experience. Yes. We all know that there are big difficulties with touring as well. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's bloody tiring. It's really stressful. I mean, of course, mm. you shouldn't underestimate that there are sacrifices you make. Yeah. But for me also, having a family at home or any, anyone who's got any roots at home, the one thing that has to count is the music you're making. When yeah. I step on stage and I perform, it has to mean something to me. Otherwise, there's no point coming 4,000 no. kilometres away. Mm. Yeah. I think there's a tremendous sense of uh, responsibility as well, you know, that that because we're an orchestra that we're, you know, as we as we know, we're self governing and we we have to survive. We only survive through our quality, you know, and and uh, and, and being being committed to the project. So I think everyone in the orchestra feels a tremendous uh, sense of responsibility. And all your travels, MCO and all the countries you lived in, what have you learned the most about stepping into? other cultures what have you learned about traveling around the world that it's a good thing or that contrary to what sometimes you hear in the media globalization is a negative thing i think it's a good thing i mean to experience you know it is so different still even though yeah globalization is happening it's not the same as even i remember you know going to america 20 years ago and you'd get your Mm. i don't know rebox that you couldn't get anywhere else (laughs) you know now you can't get everything everywhere but it's still incredibly different i mean when we go to japan next week i mean it's still like landing on another planet exactly and i love that yes um i think i mean i think one of the main things I, i learned is that when you go to a different culture don't expect them to change you have to change Oh, you know, like when you live well somewhere said. else, and yeah. it's really true. Yeah. And I think the very first, true. often the first um, uh, reaction is, "Why do they do it like that here? Yeah. Why is this is this X Y Z like this?" And they're probably and actually, thinking about you. Why are you doing that? Well, no, they yeah. don't think about it at all. Right, but but you. That's why you you can't expect or try to change anything. You just have no. to be adaptive and that. So tolerant. So, I mean, tolerance and flexibility and understanding that you're not the only culture on the planet. Yeah, it's a mm. great lesson. Yeah, yeah, it's a great lesson for anyone, I guess. Yeah, and I think it has, as we've been saying, you know, it, it has a previously it has a, a real influence on the way you make music. Yes, and 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 I think actually not only for musicians, I think everyone, yeah, in the world today, everyone should live at least one year somewhere else in a different culture. I think it would, you know, solve many things. Yeah, I feel we are coming towards the end of this podcast somehow, which has been lovely. Um, I've got one last. Um, what do they call it? Spinner twister. I'm going to throw it in the air. <laughs> The year 1788 
was the year Mozart composed his three last symphonies that we are playing here in Adelaide. Uh, this is for you, Kirsty. At the same time, that is it Botany Bay they landed Botany on? Botany Bay, yeah. And, and signed a simple document mm -hmm. establishing European Australia. Yes. Basically, at the wow. same time, he composed these Isn't pieces. That amazing. And I couldn't find anything in the Adelaide program about it. I, I hadn't realised that was <laughs> the year. That's amazing. The <laughs> wow, yeah. I only realised by Googling. Well, it's here. I mean, yeah. it's amazing yeah. still how how new, you know, our settlement here is as well. You know, yeah. when you yeah. think uh, my violin was made in 1774, which is wow. before. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how long do you reckon it would have taken Mozart to come over to Australia yeah, and perform those symphonies. Oh God! In those I mean, days. at that time with the first fleet and things, I think it was a year on the boat. Was it a year? A oh year. God! I'm pretty sure. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought like three or four months. But anyway, I want to say a huge thank you to both. For thank you. Joining Pleasure us here for thank our you, very yeah. first podcast. Um, thank you, Kirsty Hilton. Thank you, Mark Hampson. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks to you, the listeners, for following our very first Between the Bars podcast. By now, you've digested. Many stories, probably even too many. But don't forget, we're still learning. It is famously said, it takes a minimum of 10,000 hours of practice to become a professional musician. I say no more. Don't forget, stay connected with Marla Chamber Orchestra at marlachamber.com where you can find out everything going on and where we are playing in the world. Plus, of course, link to our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and email accounts. And if you come to one of our concerts, please, please don't be shy. Come say hi backstage afterwards. Next time on Between the Bars, I'm going to talk about breaking legs, climate change, flying big jumbo jets, and of course, music, with one of the world's most talented conductors, Daniel Harding. Between the Bars podcast team is Mark Parker, Matthias Mayer, and me, Yannick Dondelanger. Special thanks to Takt Eins for recording our concerts and to Tim Summers, MCO violinist, for creating Between the Bars intro music. Till next time, from the Marlow Chamber Orchestra, keep listening. Between the Bars. <laughs>